Hello and welcome to the Ohio Health EMS Grand Round Series. My name is Eric Cortez. I serve as the System EMS Medical Director for Ohio Health. Today I'm joined by my friend and colleague, Dr. Ryan Squire, to discuss medical legal risk in the pre-hospital setting. Dr. Squire is an emergency physician with Ohio Health. He is also a medical director with the freestanding ED network within Ohio Health. And he also serves as, as an EMS physician and EMS medical director as well. And last, but certainly not, not least, Dr. Squire serves as the president for the Ohio chapter of the American College of Emergency Physicians. Dr. Squire, thank you for joining us this morning. We appreciate you, you coming on with us. And thank you, Eric. I'm happy to be here and happy to talk about a, a not so um, sexy topic of medical legal risk, but definitely something that's very, very important um, that we delve into for our protection as well as the protection of our patients. I agree. This this isn't the fancy clinical topic where we're talking about ALS interventions or critical care, but every run that we, we go on in the pre-hospital setting or the out-of-hospital environment is uh, dealing with a certain degree of medical legal risk. And so it's it's not necessarily the most exciting topic, but it's a very important topic that is very influential to how we practice in day-to-day -day operations. And we, we appreciate you being here. So um, we're, we're going to cover several different topics today, including mental capacity evaluations and form refusals. We'll talk about pink slips. We'll talk about a federal regulation and law called EMTALA. We'll discuss living wills, power of attorneys, and DNRs, and we'll end with some comments on documentation pearls. So, Dr. Squire, I'm going to start by giving you a case, and we'll get into the mental capacity dis discussion. So, let's imagine that um, EMS personnel are called for a person found down outside of a restaurant. And uh, they were, there were tertiary callers, the patient's not sure what happened. But when our personnel arrive on scene, uh, they find the patient that is sitting on the ground uh, and not really sure what's going on. Uh, a precursory assessment, they see that the patient has an abrasion to their forehead and is slurring some words, but is able to answer most questions appropriately. Uh, through the course of their physical assessments and their history taking, you know, it becomes quickly apparent that the patient may have suffered a traumatic brain injury uh, and our personnel are doing the, the prudent thing by encouraging transport to the hospital for further evaluation. However, the patient denies transport to the hospital and he's refusing to go. So this creates a fairly difficult scenario for EMS personnel to uh, handle. And I think this is a nice way to start talking about medical uh, assessment of mental capacity and inform refusal. So I'll give that case to you and, and let you as the expert take it from here. Okay. So uh, obviously kind of we're, we're approaching a scene uh, where we would hope there would be bystanders. We're outside of a restaurant or a bar. Um, and obviously it's gonna be a heavily populated area. So you really need to delve into um, the population around there to help provide you with uh, some history about what may um, or may not have happened, particularly with this individual who can't give you any information. Um, when you approach him, he's slurring his speech, um, appears intoxicated, and he has signs of head injury, um, which all of those um, trigger uh, that he, he definitely does need further evaluation, further treatment. Um, Ideally, um, in a restaurant or bar setting, you'd have you'd want to get some additional history. Hopefully, find out if there's anyone who can you know, speak for him who's not under um, the influence. Um, um, that uh, is another adult, um, obviously not a minor that can take uh, responsibility for an adult. Um, but in this particular situation, you have an individual, um, not uncommon, that's going to refuse transport. Um, this individual is intoxicated. Um, and at that point, we get into kind of the capacity discussion. When you talk about uh, the ability to judge an individual's ability to receive or uh, decline treatment, um, sometimes we hear the words capacity and sometimes we hear competence. Competence is a legal definition. That's not something that we're to judge, whether from the emergency department as a physician or as an EMS provider at the scene. Uh, we are judging capacity. And when you judge capacity, you're looking at a number of things. You need to find an individual who you're certain can understand the risks associated with declining treatment. 
They need to understand the alternatives to declining that treatment. Um, and potentially in this instance, the alternatives to going to the hospital. Um, sometimes it may be, well, I don't want to go to this hospital. I prefer to go to that hospital, which um, EMS providers at the scene can obviously do their best to use some verbal de-escalation to help uh, encourage the patient to seek treatment in the, the least uh, harmful way possible. Um, and an individual in that capacity assessment needs to understand what can happen if they refuse. Um, they need to understand at, at the biggest and the biggest concern for anything, whether it's chest pain, whether it's stroke, whether it's this individual who sustained potentially a traumatic brain injury, injury could have an epidural, subdural, and intracranial bleeding. They need to understand the potential of the most serious uh, repercussion, which would be death. Um, so obviously every single person who drinks alcohol is not gonna lack capacity. Um, and so, so we need to understand that in this, in this particular situation. This individual um, being uh, confused and not recalling the incident, being under the influence, gets into the idea of an involuntary hold. Um, and a pink slip, uh, which would necessitate his transport to the hospital to receive treatment. Um, this is a, a, a situation where obviously we need to use kind of some judgment of uh, what's the, the best case scenario, what is the best thing to do for the patient. That's what we all are in the business of doing. We're all in the business of taking care of people and doing the best thing, uh, regardless of what um, we, we approach. And, and this is an instance where if, if, I read this case uh, outside of that incident, or if I was at the scene and I stepped back and just watched things and said, what does this person need? He needs to be seen in the emergency department. Um, at minimum, he needs an examination. He probably needs imaging of his head, um, as well as a thorough examination that can be done within the confines of the emergency department, not on the curb outside of a restaurant and a bar to preserve his privacy. So uh, we talk into, uh, go into that idea of involuntary holds um, and informally kind of pink slips. And those are, um, those can be placed for individuals who are, are under the influence of a substance, whether it be alcohol, whether it be a prescription drug, whether it be any type of uh, street drug. Um, if an individual is under the influence um, and, and deemed to be unable to lack that capacity, uh, a involuntary hold can be placed. It can also be placed if a person is at risk of self-harm, a risk of harming others, or they have a cognitive deficit that's suggesting that they're unable to appropriately provide self-care. Those are the four reasons uh, why we can potentially place those medical holds. And these medical holds are placed um, currently within the state of Ohio. It can be placed in, in order by a psychiatrist, a licensed uh, clinical psychologist, a licensed physician, a clinical nurse specialist who is certified as a psychiatric uh, mental health um, CNS by the American uh, Nurses Credentialing Center, a certified nurse practitioner who is certified as a psychiatric mental health NP, um, a health officer, a parole officer, a police officer, or a sheriff. And so in this instance, if you continue to have this individual who despite every attempt at kind of reasoning with and kind of verbal de-escalating, it is an instance where we may benefit from pulling police in, um, and it would not be uncommon, I imagine, in a situation like this where a restaurant has called for an individual who is intoxicated and walked out of their, their um, site for police to already be on scene. Ryan, that was an excellent <laughs> overview of really like a, a four-step process for uh, dealing with these scenarios where, number one, uh, EMS personnel have to recognize risk factors for an individual lacking capacity. You know, number two, we have to perform our capacity assessment. Number three, we need to make sure that we're a, make, we're hitting the checklist for everything that needs to happen for an informed refusal. Uh, and then four, if if we're not able to assure capacity, if it's not an informed refusal, then we have the pink slip option as well as as that fourth step. Um, I want to go back to that first step that you talked about, risk factors for lacking capacity, and you touched on intoxication, you touched on uh, substance abuse, um, but are there any other risk factors that our personnel should be looking for when they encounter a patient that's a red flag for somebody potentially lacking capacity? So, um, obviously, and I think, you know, anyone who's been uh, kind of 
on runs for long enough has has come across individuals who seem to lack capacity. And the, the biggest thing is, I think looking at what would the average person do in this situation. You know, an average person who you know is intoxicated, doesn't remember falling, has signs of head injury. You, you can make an argument in that case. Obviously, they need to to receive further care. If you come on a scene and find an individual who may be running down the street without any clothing on, the average individual would not be doing that. And it seems like something is impairing their ability um, to kind of cognitively process and function. Um, obviously, we're not going to have all of the information at that time. Um, and there may not be bystanders. This could be, you know, four in the morning and maybe it had been called from an individual who was in a park and found down. Um, we have to understand that if... You know, people still, when you talk about legal kind of risk factors, we have to we have to look at the situation and say, what would the average person do in this situation with a limited knowledge? And in the EMS environment, our knowledge is even more limited than what we have in the emergency department at many times. Um, so the the big thing, and I lump really kind of the idea of being um, intoxicated because obviously some people can be using some substance, whether it be alcohol or any, another substance, and they might, may not lack that you know, capacity at that time. There are some people who are very high functioning um, alcoholics who have to actually sustain a level of alcohol in their system so that they don't go through dangerous withdrawals. And so just because they have been drinking doesn't mean that they're gonna lack that capacity. But if they show us when we talk things, sometimes, and really when you do that capacity assessment, you need to talk and have that discussion and have them repeat it back to you so that you can say, are they really understanding what I'm saying? And, and a, a lot of times when you attempt to have that discussion, you're going to find actually there's a, a lack of a repetition. They're, they're unable to recall a lot of the things. And at that point, it's, it's obvious that we need, we need to move forward um, in making sure that they receive care. Yeah, a lot of excellent points there. And I think you really hit on a lot of those risk factors that we're looking for, both from our history, past medical, vital signs, physical assessments, and the behavior that the patient's demonstrating on scene. And when when you were talking about you know performing the mental capacity assessment, you know, you use a lot of good verbs in, in my opinion. You talked about demonstrating understanding and appreciation and communication and uh, rational thought. Uh, and uh, those are all important to look for when you're performing a mental capacity evaluation. Um, Ryan, when, when you review charts from, from the pre-hospital setting, what are, some, uh, what are some common mistakes that you sometimes see uh, when personnel are performing a mental capacity evaluation? Um, one, one thing that is, uh, you, you know, when, when the questions asked, well, does the patient have capacity? A lot of times it's said, well, they're alert and oriented times 3 or times 4. Is mental capacity evaluation more than just alertness and orientation? And if so, what other things on your physical assessment? Are you looking for, uh, to indicate capacity is intact? So, um. Uh, absolutely, being alert and oriented times four is a component of uh, demonstrating that capacity. But we have to understand it, it, especially kind of in the pre-hospital setting, even in the emergency department setting, if we're attempting to demonstrate capacity in a patient's decision to either decline transport or even sign out against medical advice in the emergency department, we want to delve in a bit further. We have to understand that that capacity assessment can be looked at hard. If we decide to place a patient on a medical hold, um, that may be, you know, someone may come back and challenge that. So we want to make sure we have all the documentation in a row that supports our decision to move that way. Uh, because you have to understand you're placing someone on an involuntary hold that can last up to three days um, that the courts are open. So that if, you, if somebody's placed on a medical hold on a Friday, they could be on a medical hold through Tuesday feasibly since the courts are closed on Saturday and Sunday. And some people will obviously challenge that if, at some point in your career, and you want to make sure you have the documentation documentation to support. Hey, you know, I, there there was yes, the patient may have been alert and oriented times three, and I have that chart. I may have you know checked that box, especially on you know a lot of um, our pre-hospital forms now, where we we can just pretty much check that. But you want to show, hey, yes, they were alert and oriented times three, but in my capacity assessment, here's what I discussed with them. 
here's um, the risks I shared with them. And they did not appear to be able perhaps to understand what I was saying. They could not reiterate that in the, the exact way. And it doesn't have to be verbatim. They need to use their own words. But if they don't show in discussing that with you, um, you, you can kind of move forward, obviously, with that uh, medical hold and showing that you know they lack the capacity. If we do sh say they have the capacity, you want to be especially uh, kind of notable. If, if you have an individual like this who you, is left at the scene, had uh, was intoxicated, um, the the restaurant you know is going to kind of say, yeah, this guy was you know intoxicated, left our facility, hit his head, um, and something there's a bad outcome because he didn't receive treatment. We especially need to be on top of our, our documentation in that instance. It's not, oh, well, a patient declined transport. It should be patient was discuss our concerns uh, for uh, the potential for a serious injury. Patient demonstrated that he understood those concerns, including the potential for death. Um, and he declined transport despite a extensive time spent with the patient. And even, you know, obviously you're putting your time on scene, time off of scene. But you want to talk about how long a, t a time you've had a discussion with the patient and try to encourage him um, and not just, oh, well, patient decline transport and leave. Uh, because if there is a bad outcome and it may not happen, you know, it's not going to happen every time, but it may happen once out of, you know, a thousand or 10,000 times. And that is something that, you know, will be looked at if there is a bad outcome. And you want to make sure that your document documentation supports everything that you did, every discussion, you know, that you had in that instance. And yeah, you're not giving medications, particularly in that instance, but you want to you want to discuss the conversations you had, and you want to actually make sure, um, at least what I do in the emergency department setting for things like this, and when I'm really concerned that yes, they have the capacity to to make this decision and they're leaving, and I think it's a really bad idea. I have the patient actually write in their own words on on. Uh, Kind of what's going to become part of their medical chart of what we discussed about, and I have them sign it. So you know, if something does happen, we can go back, we can look and say, "Hey, look, I I actually had this discussion, and here's their own writing that they understood what could happen um, and what I was recommending, and they signed it." Yeah, that's those are excellent points, and that incorporates the documentation piece as well. And just walking through this step by step, if we arrive on scene like this, the first thing again is looking for those risk factors for could this individual lack capacity. And if you see some of those risk factors, if you're concerned, then moving into your capacity assessment and um, recognizing that, just like you said, that the alertness, orientation are a component of the capacity assessment. But it's really important to judge cognition, rationalization, the ability to communicate. And you mentioned, you know, disclosing to the patient what you're concerned about and making sure they can put that into their own words and reiterate it back to you is a nice, simple, easy way to assess capacity on scene and then making sure that all gets into your documentation. This is definitely one of those charts where you're going to want to um, to have at least a few statements in the narrative on your capacity assessment. Um, so, Dr. Squire is. This something when when personnel are doing a capacity assessment, is this kind of like an all or nothing? So if if you're on scene and you recognize somebody that has risk factors for lacking capacity, but you do a good capacity assessment and you feel 100% confident that they have capacity, then uh, I believe then you can allow that patient to refuse as long as it's an informed refusal. But if it's anything less than like 99 to 100% sure that they have capacity, would you say that it's safer to, 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 to just play it safe? And if you're not 100% sure, then just treat them like they lack capacity? In other words, is, is that the safer route than potentially letting somebody leave that doesn't have capacity? And that's a great question, Eric. And, and you know, we're, you know, we're in an instance with, especially when we, we go on runs, we're not alone. We've got a number of crew members with us. And so that's something where we all have to have a discussion. I think every single person on the truck needs to say, hey, yes, I'm in agreement. This person does seem to have capacity. Or even if one person's kind of not, not 100% on board with that, I think we need to move forward and say, hey, we are going to take you to the hospital. That's what we need to do. Um, because, you know, it's better to act just like when we may be, and, and we're going to talk about this in a little bit. 
But just like when we may enter into a, a, an arrest situation and we don't know if someone's a do not resuscitate or not, we're going to err on the side of obviously give those life-saving measures and answer questions after if we find out, yes, oh, yeah, they are DNR, and then we can, we can pull back. So we want to make sure we're doing the best thing and the best thing in the interest of the patient. We want to make sure everybody on the, the truck is comfortable with the things. And if we do decide someone, you know, has that capacity to make that decision, the, the best thing is obviously to kind of turn them over to a friend or family member. When we talk about capacity, there's a couple instances where we need to understand um, who can and cannot uh, refuse transport. Obviously, capacity assessment is, is important for that. But we need to understand there are uh, instances that when we make a run on a minor, an individual under 18 years old, they cannot refuse transport um, except for a few um, exceptions that include um, if that individual does serve in the armed forces, they can refuse. Um, if it is a minor who is pregnant or is um, caring for, um, does have a child, um, they are able to uh, speak for themselves. Um, emancipate, legally emancipated minors are able to uh, refuse transport, um, and a minor who is married um, can uh, refuse transport. But other than that, we need to make sure that we do have um, the consent of a parent or guardian uh, for uh, these individuals, though assuredly there's instances where we may run on like a 16-year-old who's involved in a, a car accident and can't particularly speak for themselves. And in that instance, we've got implied consent um, at the scene, which with the vast majority, what would the majority of people do in this situation? They would seek care, um, et cetera. So we do need to understand there are some caveats of individuals refusing transport that uh, many times uh, rolls back to the, the minors. And those are sometimes hard to sort through and even keep track. And so if you encounter a situation like that, this may be something where you call a supervisor or you contact medical control to help sort through those very rare instances as well. Question about a pink slip, Ryan. Um, so pink slips, as you outlined, are indicated for several different reasons. Uh, and a lot of times EMS personnel are on scene uh, when an individual is pink slipped. So if EMS personnel arrive on scene and an officer of the state has uh, determined that this individual needs to be pink slipped, requires pink slipped. Um, can an individual that's pink slipped have mental capacity and refuse EMS care? Absolutely. Um, an a capacity assessment is just one component and an individual can have the capacity um, you know, to potentially refuse care, but they might be pink slipped because they're refusing care, but they're suicidal. Um, or they're, you know, homicidal or, you know, they're refusing care. And, you know, there's many times where, you know, we hear from um, EMS when they're on scene that, hey, this person's, you know, living environment is, is in squalor and, you know, they're not caring for themselves. They're not capable of caring for themselves. And in instances like that, we have to be an advocate for the patient. We have to be an advocate for their health and safety. Um, and we can obviously say, hey, they might be alert, they might be oriented, they may understand the risk of, of not kind of receiving care. But if, again, going back to that, the vast majority of people, if they came onto this scene and saw this, they would say, this person does need this, and they don't, they can't refuse in that instance. Um, and so someone could be deemed to uh, have capacity, but we can still place them on a medical hold if it's thought to be in their best interest for their safety because they may not be acting in their best interest or they may be at a risk of harming others. Yeah, you, you know, as with most medical legal items that we talk about, a lot of times the answer is it depends, you know, and it's challenging to sort through some of these things. But I think, as you pointed out, if if we're doing things in the best interest of the, of the patient and Recognizing that if somebody else has pink slipped the patient that we're running on, you know, that it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to do X, Y, or Z, but it means that we have an added responsibility to making sure that patients get to where they need to go and working with our colleagues that are on scene uh, to make sure that the patient is going where they need to go. So thanks for your insight on that. Um, with that, I would like to shift into our next topic and um, I want to talk about MTALA. So 
Uh, MTALA, as I mentioned before, is a federal law that can, that can be impactful to some EMS operations in clinical care. Um, I wanted to hand it over to you. Can, can you explain to us what MTALA is and how it could potentially impact EMS personnel and EMS agencies? Yeah, so EMTALA is the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act. Uh, it was enacted federally in 1986. Um, and kind of the, the reasons behind it, I, I mean, we could talk for hours just about why EMTALA happened. Um, and it, it more or less, the, 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 the simplest way to put it is it, it's an, a, a quote, anti-dumping law. Um, and, you know, this, this has to do with the fact that, you know, back in the uh, 1980s, there would be instances where certain hospitals may not have taken care of patients um, for factors that may have dealt with their ability to pay. Um, or not pay. Um, and they may have deferred to kind of the city hospitals in certain instances. And in 1986, they enacted this federal law that says that anyone coming to an emergency department seeking treatment uh, must be stabilized and treated uh, regardless of their insurance status or ability to pay. Um, and this this is a, 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 where it gets interesting in that um, that seeking treatment um, has to do with arriving within 250 yards of a hospital campus, not the emergency department entrance, 250 yards of a hospital campus um, seeking treatment. Um, it, it, it is a, a responsibility of that hospital, whether it's you know a, a tertiary center um, or if it's even a freestanding emergency department um, that does uh, function under this uh, MTALA um, a mandate by the government. It's been in, in a law now for well over 30 years. It's uh, kind of the emergency medicine badge of honor, at least I feel that way, um, because it says that I'm going to take care of anyone and everyone that comes here uh, because that's what we do. Um, and so we need to understand um, that component, uh, particularly when um, seeking uh, transport. And as um, you know, my role kind of in the freestanding network. Um, and as we've had these freestanding emergency departments over the last decade pop up around the city, I have witnessed many kind of instances where uh, we might even get something over the radio where EMS calls and says, you know, is this, you know, this okay to bring here? Well, yeah, it's, it's an emergency department um, and we are going to provide care for any patient that is brought to our facility. That's our responsibility in an emergency department as an emergency medicine physician, that's what I do. Um, but we also need to be aware of the capabilities of destinations, whether they're freestanding emergency departments um, or they're tertiary hospitals. Just like we've always taught in pre-hospital transport, um, we need to be aware of the, the capabilities with regard to pediatrics, with regard to stroke care, with regard to cardiac care, including a potential for doing casts, uh, with regard to trauma care, and then any other potential special needs that patients may, may require um, for a, a number of reasons, we need to take those into account when we deem kind of what that ideal facility for transport is going to be. Excellent. And how would you say that, so that, so that there's a potential impact to EMS um, when determining destination decisions? Um, what about EMS agencies that are involved in interfacility transport? How? How can MTALA impact their day-to-day -day operations? And do you have any advice for what they can look out for or be aware of when performing interfacility transport? So, and when we do interfacility transport, we need to understand if we're transferring from one emergency department um, to another hospital, especially now that we have the freestanding networks, but it's not even uncommon for us potentially to transfer within Ohio Health. We might be at Marion and transfer down to Riverside or to Grant. And we have to understand with those transports, um, they were focusing on transferring the patient potentially to a higher level of care. Um, let's say I'm at a, a freestanding emergency department and I have an individual who walks through the doors um, complaining of chest pain. I do a 12 lead EKG. They've got ST elevations in their inferior leads with some reciprocal changes. It's you know clear cut STEMI. We start some things and I'm gonna get on the phone and, and speak with a cardiologist um, to accept that patient to have a cath done. When I speak with a, a, an individual at another facility who has the capability of providing treatment that I can't perform at my facility, I have a receiving physician. And so there has been a, 
uh, a plan of care for that patient. And so that interfacility transport um, is dependent on what that plan of care has been, been done. And we sign EMTALA forms that talk about, okay, I've had a discussion, I can't do this, but I need, and, I, and this patient needs this done, and I've already talked with someone who's accepting of them, They're, they have the bed uh, capacity to um, accept this patient, they can provide the care that the patient needs, um, and I have done everything within my power here in my emergency department, potentially you know, starting heparin, potentially doing thrombolytics, um, providing the patient with aspirin, providing with pain medication, and stabilizing them to the best of my ability uh, prior to transferring on to uh, the destination facility for continuation of care. And so the biggest thing with the interfacility transport we need to understand is, has that facility done everything in their duty to stabilize the patient to the best of their ability? And do they have a receiving physician at the receiving institution um, that is, is going to take, again, that's downfield and going to receive the pass? That's, I mean, we don't want to have an interception somewhere in the, the kind of in that pass that's already been established. Um, if, if, we, if something happens, and occur, uh, surely if we have long transport times of you know, an hour or two hour from some facilities and something happens and that patient has a change of condition en route, we can stop at an emergency department and seeking kind of additional assistance. If they're not able to kind of provide that definitive care, again, then we can continue on to that final destination once we've sought that additional care. Um, but the biggest thing for EMS to understand for the interfacility transport is that there's things that are already in motion and we don't want to interrupt that uh, because we have to have that receiving physician at the other institution, and we have that plan in place so that, that that patient's care is streamlined and there are no delays in that care, particularly when it's things like whether it's trauma or it's stroke or it's you know cardiac, where it is very time sensitive. Yeah, very, very, very well said, uh, especially for the time critical diagnoses that you brought up. Um, that was very well done. Thank you. Um, Let's shift gears again, and I'm going to give you another case, and I'd like to talk about living wills, power of attorneys, healthcare power of attorneys, and DNRs. So let's say that our personnel go on a scene for a 67-year-old male in cardiac arrest. Um, daughter's on scene who identifies herself as a healthcare power of attorney, uh, presents you, our personnel with a living will, and says, you know, I don't want my dad to be re resuscitated Families on scene, wife, and they all agree, um, but there's no DNR paperwork. So you got a power of attorney, you got a living will, but no DNR paperwork. So could you walk us through each of those three things, a living will, power of attorney, and a DNR, and give us some advice on how we would handle this situation uh, and how we would make that decision about do we work or not, or in, is there anything between that we can compromise with? And you know this is this is not an uncommon you know, situation. It's not uncommon to actually have family that might not have the paperwork. They don't know where it is when something happens at three in the at three in the morning, and you know it's it's locked away in the safe or hidden away in a filing cabinet. They may not have it. But in instances where we do have family members that are on scene and they've got that paperwork, that is a, a blessing because you have to understand just like when we talk about you know ability to, to for patients to have capacity and we defer to uh, other you know family members or friends or colleagues that may be at the scene. This is an instance where we really need to defer to those people who can speak for that individual in this situation who cannot. Um, when we talk about you know if we first kind of shift onto do not resuscitate orders, um, do not resuscitate orders. Um, in 2019 in Ohio, it's a single page form um, to make it kind of easier to kind of visualize what it looks like. Um, and so, so we know what we're looking for and we know kind of what that stands for. Do not resuscitate, you, you have kind of three categories. You're gonna have an individual who is full code, um, so they would not have any type of do not resuscitate order. An individual may have a do not resuscitate comfort care, which is a DNRCC. That means that you know we are really focusing on comfort measures for this patient. We're not going to do any extraordinary um, uh, treatments for them. Um, and really, at, at that point, when someone has entered into a do not resuscitate comfort care, many times they have some underlying terminal condition 
um, that we realize they are near end of life. They may be in hospice care. Do not resuscitate comfort care or rest. Um, DNR CCA um, is a, a caveat where someone is has made a decision that they do not want to be resuscitated if they should sustain a cardiac arrest. So if we enter a scene and someone is, you know, and they're you know talking to us on scene, and then all of a sudden they go asystolic and they have a DNR CCA, that is their wish that we would not do any extraordinary measures. We would not do CPR. We would not do ACLS. Um, in that instance. Sometimes, and, and we're seeing this kind of with increasing uh, frequency, we'll see kind of a DNI caveat to that DNRCCA, uh, which just means that an individual um, does not want to be, does not want to have uh, CPR or ACLS performed if they should arrest. But if they would have, sustain a respiratory arrest, they do not want to be intubated. They do not want to be placed on a ventilator. And so these are, these are, uh, decisions that are made when people are of sound mind, um, saying this is something I've thought about. Um, this is something that you know either the individual will sign uh, or a healthcare power of attorney will sign, um, and a physician or a nurse practitioner will sign saying this is this is what the patient wants um, if that should occur. So then we kind of enter into kind of what's a healthcare power of attorney. Um, so a healthcare power of attorney is a legal document um, that lets an individual uh, authorize a specific agent to, that's gonna make healthcare decisions uh, for them in healthcare situations where the patient uh, is no longer able to make such decisions. Um, they can uh, ultimately allow that healthcare power of attorney collect private health information on them um, and act in their best interest. A healthcare power of attorney is not a financial power of attorney. So we need to understand that there's a, a deviation there, which is a good thing, and that's for good reason. Um, so when someone has a healthcare power of attorney assigned to them, uh, for instance, you know, this individual, the 67 year old male who sustained a cardiac arrest, he realized and he's had discussions, and this is a legal document that he said, Hey, I want my daughter to be my voice if something happens. Um, and I'm not able to be that voice because we've had these discussions. She knows what I want um, and I trust her to make that decision. And so if someone presents a healthcare power of attorney form um, and that is in fact them, they have every right in an instance where a patient cannot make decisions or voice their, their wishes uh, to be their voice. Um, you know, many times this will be, you know, someone may have an individual in their, their family who is um, in healthcare, whether it be a nurse, uh, whether they may work in, in the field with EMS, or they may be a physician. And the family knows, like, they know what's in their best interest, and they know that that's what they're going to have in mind when they fill out these healthcare power of attorney. Um, and then, you know, and in addition to that, many individuals have living wills. And a living will is a document as compared to having a person that you've identified that can speak for you. It's a document that speaks for you. It's, it's a document that says, you do not wish to have life-sustaining treatment uh, performed um, to include artificially or technology supplied nutrition and hydration. Um, if you are unable to make medical decisions and you are in a terminal condition or a permanently unconscious state, so this is a document that you would have um, that voices what your wishes are. And frankly, it's helpful to many times have both a living well and a healthcare power of attorney um, so that, you know, we, we and, and, you know, Eric, you can voice that as well. In the emergency department setting, many times it's very emotional when unexpected things uh, occur. Um, and when, when family has the ability to say, well, you know, especially if it's a healthcare power of attorney, the stress of everything that's going on, it may be a difficult time for them to process everything. And they have that living will to kind of go back on and say, hey, I remember, you know, dad signed this and he said, I don't want X, Y, or Z um, because I don't want to live like that. Um, and it helps um, us to, to kind of show them like, hey, you know, it looks like we've had this discussion. It looks like he's looked over these things. And both of these are legal documents to have at the scene, to have a, a, a family member present you with. You absolutely need to respect that. And in any instance, you know, I, I said earlier, we always want to make sure we're doing the best thing for the patients. And sometimes the best thing for a patient is not doing anything um, in instances where that is their wish. Our, our biggest thing is we got to respect uh, patients' wishes 
um, about the care that they receive, and particularly when we get into end of life matters. I I like how you paired up the living will with the healthcare power of attorney, and they supplement each other, and they they both serve a purpose, and some of it's overlapping, and some of it's separate. Uh, but that living will provides that objective measure of, of, of the patient's wishes. And then a, a healthcare power of attorney can interpret that and interpret the current circumstance, interpret the feelings of the family and other loved ones and make a nice decision that can be uh, informative for providers on scene, but also assuring that their loved one uh, gets the end of life care that they hope for as well. So I appreciate that explanation. Um, Transitioning into our last topic, Ryan, I just want to talk about some documentation pearls. And I think you would agree with me as an emergency physician, it's probably one of the least favorite things that we do. You know, it certainly takes up a lot of time. Uh, I didn't go into medicine to be able to document in a EHR, but it's a necessary thing that we need to do uh, for patient care, for quality, for safety, to protect us, our departments, our hospitals, et cetera. So, uh, from a medical legal risk standpoint, you know, do you have a handful of things that you can share with our listeners about either ways to to chart to protect yourself to to uh, assure you know quality patient care and so forth? So um, you know, obviously, you know, documentation pearls. Um, you know, the, the big the big thing is, and and whether it's it's in the in the hospital environment, in the pre hospital environment. If it happened, document it. You know that's that's the biggest thing. You don't want to leave things out. Um, you know, if you obviously administered medication, if you did a specific treatment, if you you know uh, attempted intubation times two, you want to document that so that it's there. So that if we kind of as we review that run, we can look at that and understand that scene better. And definitely, you know, if it's a month or two months down the line, um, and it's not the day after. We, it's going to help draw our memory. The more documentation to have that that shows specific instances where where that what and uh, occurred in that instance. Um, you know, when when we talk about you know documentation, obviously we want to get a good idea of what has happened. And, and I guess you know, say say there was a bad outcome from a run or or a, a decision in terms of treatment, you know, that was uh, performed. And when we talk about medical legal risk, obviously we're always kind of delving back to what happens if something goes wrong and someone wants to pull this chart. Um, through Ohio Revised Code, um, there's immunity provided to public EMS providers in civil action for injury, death, um, or loss of, of property uh, from emergency medical services, unless the services are administered in a manner that constitutes willful or wanton misconduct and deed is again, a uh, deviation from uh, standard protocol. Um, and so if there's something that happens that is atypical, um, we need to make sure that, that we, we document that and we need to document why that happened. And you need to be especially certain in those instances that you've got that documentation to support why this action was done. Um, we talked earlier about you know individuals who may um, have capacity assessments and have uh, not have the capacity to make decisions. You want to have your documentation to a T to support your decision to transport that patient, particularly if a patient is not happy about going to the hospital and not happy about kind of moving forward. Um, if there's any ever any use of restraint by EMS, you want to make sure that your documentation supports that. You want to make sure that you document that you did use verbal de-escalation strategies prior to uh, going towards more um, intense um, and more invasive things. If we ever have to do a cricothyrotomy, you want to make sure that you've got documentation to support. We attempted intubation three times. We were unable to. The patient was desatting, and we needed to crike the patient in the field. It's not something that we do often, but we want to make sure that we have documentation to support. Hey, you know, we didn't just go straight to a crike. Um, we did attempt um, these less invasive things, these le less traumatic things to a patient first and foremost. Um, so I, I think the biggest thing in terms of, you know, for your documentation, you want to make sure if you pull the chart of a, a chest pain patient on, you know, March 10th, 
and you pulled a chart on May 20th on a chest pain patient, that you can tell the difference between those two patients. It, it doesn't, your documentation doesn't look like, well, this is a chest pain patient, so my documentation looks the exact same. You wanna make sure that there are different things about um, that instance that you can kind of rely on, pull out, so that it can even jog your memory. If somebody sat that report in front of you that you wrote, and you go, oh yeah, I absolutely remember that, and it's not your standard you know, chest pain um, run where you've got specific kind of characters that, that you can pull from that that jog your memory. Yeah, and you know, I think it's important to remember that charts serve multiple purposes, one being clinical care, uh, one being, you know, quality assurance and patient safety, billings an aspect of documentation as well. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of eyes that come on these charts, especially if you're on an assault or a car accident, you know, there can be a lot of uh, different legal personnel that are looking at your chart, uh, and uh, of course, from a malpractice standpoint, that that comes into play as well. So, I think a, an important point to remember is that you, you know your documentation. You may think it's only internal to your department, um, but there's a lot of eyes that that get laid on your charts, both at the hospital setting and external to the healthcare community. So, with that being said, Ryan, do you have any um, do you have any thoughts on uh, anything to necessarily keep out of the documentation? What are things that would make maybe a lawyer have some red flags about this chart? So um, in, any inconsistency is a big thing. You wanna make sure that um, that you don't have an inconsistency because one inconsistency in your chart can make your entire chart look, it's, it's worthless in the sense that uh, we've automatically delineated that you didn't tell the truth about this, so we can't trust you know, anything further um, in the chart. So you wanna make sure that there's a consistent, that you have documented things. You don't wanna just you know, show, you know, you always got a, a manual blood pressure of 120 over 80. Um, that we, we know that that's probably not you know, accurate. You wanna make sure that you're documenting a consistent um, history. Um, you wanna make sure you consistently hit on, on things you know, at the scene. The, the other, um, you know, big thing when we talk about um, kind of charts and what we want to make sure, um, you want to make sure that, that, that again, everything that you did on scene is, is there. Um, you want to make sure that, that obviously that they can tell um, specifics that, that are there that are not going to cause red flags of, you know, you, you pulled up and, you know, it's, it's an MVC and it says rear-ended and the, the patient was actually, you know, it was a head-on collision. You want to make sure, kind of go back, make sure that everything there before um, you turn your report in. Um, I think the, the biggest thing is making sure that obviously the, 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 the documentation is consistent and make sure, obviously, if it happened, if you did something for the patient, if you bandaged their left arm, if you placed them in a splint, if you put a sling on, that you have it documented that you provided that care. Um, so that obviously that we can rely on it, we can look back at it and be like, oh yeah, you know, the patient said, you know, they, they had a horrible right shoulder pain and no one did anything. But what we have here that they were provided with a, a sling and they, you know, their arm was splinted uh, by EMS prior to even arrival at the hospital. Yeah, great point. <laughs> the chart is a medical legal document and it's one of the easiest ways to reduce medical legal risk is by having a good medical legal document in your patient care report uh, as a way to mitigate risk um, in each of these topics that we covered uh, today the capacity assessment and form refusal pink slips living wills dnrs you know these are are higher risk scenarios that uh, are directly and indirectly related to patient care, uh, but they all require us to do the right thing for the patient uh, to making sure that we're doing a, a good assessment and documenting appropriately and having a working knowledge of these very complex topics for the out of hospital environment. Uh, Ryan, from a medical legal perspective, uh, are there any points uh, or, um, you know, any pieces of wisdom that you can pass along to our EMS personnel that are listening? I think anything the, that you'd the, like to close with? Yeah, the one other thing, you know, obviously, and, and, and I said it, you know, earlier is, you know, if it happened, document it with documentation pearls. 
Um, but one kind of last thing with regard to documentation is you don't want to show any emotion in your documentation. Um, you know, there's plenty of times where, you know, I, I'm sure, you know, Eric, you can attest to it. We've both read um, whether it's, you know, medical charts or it's, you know, pre-hospital reports um, where you can sense uh, a provider's view of a patient. Um, and you want to make sure that these, these don't show emotion. You know, surely there may be instances where we may be frustrated on a scene, but you just want to give the information of what was done and you do not want to uh, convey any type of judgment or emotion in your reports. You want to make sure that it is not biased in any way. You want to provide the information and the treatment that you provided because when push comes to shove, we're all in this to take care of people. We're all in this to help our communities out. Um, and for that, I, I salute you all. Um, and I appreciate everything all of you do um, kind of in, in helping us uh, provide care in the emergency department and helping take care of all of our community members um, throughout you know, Central Ohio and the state. Um, so I, I appreciate um, everyone's efforts on a, on a daily basis. Yeah, I, I think your point there is very important is, you know, remain objective in your documentation, uh, sticking to the facts, uh, being objective. It's a great way to not only make your chart uh, very accurate and reflect your patient care, but it's a nice way to remove any cognitive biases that you may have uh, when you're trying to sort through things on scene and perform an accurate assessment and make correct decisions about treatment and destination. So. I think that's a uh, great point to end on. Um, I want to thank you, Dr. Squire, for joining us uh, on our EMS Grand Round series. Again, Dr. Squire is one of our emergency physicians. He's a freestanding ED medical director and also wears the EMS hat and, and is our uh, interfacility transport expert within Ohio Health EMS and just a wealth of knowledge. And we appreciate you being here with us today. My pleasure. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for everything you're doing out there for us. I second that. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions or feedback, please feel free to reach out to Ohio Health EMS. You can also reach out to me directly. My email is eric.cortez at ohiohealth.com. Um, we're always very responsive to getting back to you. So any questions, feedback, or any other comments, feel free to reach out. And we appreciate your time this morning. Thank you.